We're going to pop right into the message today. This is more a prophetic word than a message, a lesson, a teaching. It's just what I've been hearing God talking about the last months. There's been some months I've been kind of chewing on this thing. What happens is when I get a, a word, sometimes it comes out as like this. And I, and I want you to understand because it's, we're a prophetic church. And this is how sometimes you know you've got a word brewing is that you're getting super irritated, like super irritated and super frustrated. And then it comes out and bursts out as passion. And I think last week, sometime, the beginning of the week, I had this word just burst out in passion. I'm like, and I went, da, 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 and I preached the whole word probably in like five minutes and in a mostly empty kitchen. And so this told me it was time to release the word. It was time to release this word. This word isn't necessarily for ignite. So I don't want you to think in the terms of ignite our, our, just our family. This word is for the, the, the church of Christ in the United States, okay? So this word is for the corporate church, the big C church. Those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are the church together, not I singly am the church. We are the church, the body of Christ. I am speaking to the generalized church in America right now. There, there is something about the way God created me that I can see when things are imbalanced, right? There should never be an extreme either way, but a lot of times we'll go from one extreme to a totally other extreme in order to try to correct the, the first extreme and end up way off road in another alignment. And what, what we're needing to do now is centralize into true center, into true, like, you know, I see like a level with a bubble in the middle, and the bubble's going to level off in the center now instead of being way over here or way over here. We're going to be straight in the middle with Christ. So this word is for the church, the body of Christ as a whole, specifically in the United States. Listen, right now, God himself is redefining what the body of Christ should look like for us. He is showing us a new way. Remember in the last several months, you're hearing me almost out of irritation saying, Dude, we got to do something different. Something has to change. We're, we have got to create a new way that reaches people right where they're at in authenticity that is in alignment with what God is doing right now, today. Two things have risen up so far in that end. And then more of the word will be to follow. Listen, two things have risen up since I have been chewing on this and wrestling with God on this very topic of like, we have a mass exodus of people in the corporate church, the going to each a building and meeting with each other and having um, time together. We have had a major shift and there is a mass exodus and that indicates that something must change. Two things have risen up so far. The first one is love. Love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, until then, there are three things that remain. Thus, our sermon series that we are embarking on right now, faith, hope, and love. Yet, love surpasses them all. Above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. It's got to be about love in every circumstance and I think that love is such a multifaceted deep subject that encompasses so many things what do we do how do we love in the midst of disagreement how do we love in the middle of our enemies how do we love when a relationship ends how do we love when a relationship starts how do we love in the midst of agreement how do we love in the midst of discipline how do we love what is love and then we bring, God was bringing to me my life first. This verse has been resonating over and over and over again the last four years. Listen to this. This is so important. I want to plasper this on a wall in the house. Remember to stay alert and hold firmly to what you believe. Be mighty and full of courage. 
Let love and kindness be the motivation behind all you do. Now today, I really want to highlight that word. Let love and kindness be the motivation in all we do. I have noticed that the body of Christ in the United States does not know how to love in the midst of disagreement. Now I want to remind you that denomination started when Luther, and I tell you what, he was coming up uh, against some wrongs and some imbalances, but what happened as a result were denominations. Luther puts these things on the door of these are disagreements. This is, and all of a sudden we've got denominations formed. We're no longer one church, one body, but we are denominations that have separated because of disagreement. And then forevermore, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of denominations are birthed every day. And what is horribly sickening in my heart is that we will look at one denomination and condemn them and curse them because they are different than me. And each one, we are all the body of Christ. Each one is a member with a gift to offer. And in as such, I really believe that not just each single person is a part of the body, a hand, a foot, a toe, a head. You know that scripture. Each person is that, but also each little family, this each little tight-knit family is part of the body of Christ. Therefore, you may have a, a little church that gathers that has that that they're supposed to be doing the food pantry and feeding the widows and and doing those things and then you've got a large church that's all about evangelism and just reaching souls for Christ and each person you, we criticize the evangelistic church for not going deep enough for the mature people and we criticize the mature churches for not speaking the the bare bones gospel enough and we criticize the church that is not doing the food pantry for not doing the food pantry and we're sitting there and we come against one another when God has always said let us be one as we are one fathers and holy spirit is one and that is what love looks like we are body soul spirit we are not in disunity with ourselves and when we are it's messy okay God is not in disunity with himself, nor does he wish for the body of Christ as a whole. Those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he has not designed us to critique, criticize, and disunify, criticize the leaders, tear them down, pull them down, wreck them, nor do we, does he want us to put leaders on a pedestal and idolize them. They're both imbalances, and they both need to come in the center and be corrected, and the way that we're to correct it is through love. Love's the answer, guys. Number two, so there's love, and then there's selfless ministry. There's too much me-centricness. And I'm saying, okay, listen, there's an extreme over here. We got way too focused on everything else that we didn't take care of our emotional health, our physical health, and our spiritual health. But now on the other side, we're getting so me-centric and about the diagnosis that I carry. We're, we're so about what makes me feel good, what makes me happy, what makes me comfortable, what makes me satisfied. And we have now gone to a totally different extreme. Both are valuable. Understand, both are value. I have to love myself, I have to love God, and I have to love others. Never should I be centralized on only a single if I am completely immersed in loving myself, then I'm in an excess of being a narcissist. If I am completely overriding myself to serve others and to be other focused, I am destroying myself by not having self-care. We have to love. First, let God love us. Then we are empowered to truly love one another. And we don't we don't disperse because we disagree. We stay together because we're family. And those who are my family dig on know it. And we disagree up sometimes. So listen, God is redefining what church looks like in the United States. And he's wanting to. But I think by accident, and this is my opinion, 
may not be the opinion of others, but on my observance is church leaders have mistakenly, accidentally redefined church too. But was it in alignment with the kingdom is my question. Yes, God is redefining what the church looks like and how the church operates, specifically in the United States. But did the leaders listen to kingdom alignment or have they gotten in another excess? And I'll tell you what, it started the day the world shut down with COVID. Church leaders did not know what to do. I didn't know what to do. What, how do we do this? Government's telling us one thing. God's telling us one thing. They all are just kind of pieces of the whole. And we were in an impossible position to be able to handle this. You could not be right. The church leaders, I, I wish we could see some more compassion for them in the United States right now because there is a movement to just tear apart because, yes, there was an imbalance on the ego side as a whole. But no, they're not to be torn apart and wrecked. That is not the way you fix that. The way you fix that is love. Love does not tear down and hurt and tear apart and diminish, but it builds up, it cheers up, and it stirs up. When the COVID pandemic hit us in 2020, most of us did not know how to respond. I think most of us were thinking of how to handle the thing that was in front of our nose right now at the moment, and we didn't think long game. I'm sure, and, and let me, please understand me, it doesn't include every single leader, but it includes, I'm going to say this is an average, okay? This is what happened. We didn't know. We're human. This is why you don't idolize your leaders. We're human. We, we didn't know what to do. So we responded. But in that time, we saw church leader after church leader after church leader putting video messages up. Even some really amazing churches, which I love with all of my heart, they put a little video message up. So here you got a minister, they're preaching to a completely empty room, and then people are at home in their bunny slippers and their underwear, and they're watching it on their TV. And you know what we did by accident, and I am so sorry that this happened, but we, we said, this is church. You have now gone to church. You watching a video of me on a screen talking is now church. And God talked to me in that time, and he's like, this is not how I'm defining church. And I actually was so irritated by that. I'm like, I am not doing that. And I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying I heard it different. And that's why we, our Zoom service is interactive. It's about relationship. It's about people. But if you come with your hair undone, your makeup not done, and in your bunny slippers, it's still okay. In fact, I would be okay if you came with your jammies on. Today. We have had people come with their jammies on to church in the last eight years. And it is okay. The, see what I mean by balance? But the church leaders just put a video message up so they could feed their sheep. We're not a sheep, by the way. We're people. So they can feed the people. And we got to this place where we go. And what really breaks my heart is the years and years before that, you will see all of those same voices saying, we have to do this in the context of community. We have to do this in context of relationship. God did not desire, design you to do this alone. That is the message that reverberated over and over and over again. But we hear COVID and we say, let's do church by watching a pastor <laughs> preach a sermon on Sunday. And I'm telling you, that is a distraction. And that is not church. You sitting at home in your underwear with your bunny slippers on is not doing church. And I'll tell you what, it's got a missing ingredient. So they accidentally... And by the way, with really good hearts, just doing what they knew to do, they accidentally redefined church in a way that God did not design it. We are missing something so important. Turn to Acts chapter 2 with me, my favorite. Love me some Acts chapter 2. I gotta get some. Cindy, you did good. Look at all the glitter. It's like the floor is glowing up here. This is great. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Every believer was faithfully, this is when the church was formed. This is when we started like doing church. Look at that started happening. I mean, most of the time back in the day, you, you found your church leader and you followed them all over the countryside. <laughs> you know, you gave up your life and you just, these, you know, some fisher guys were up and walking and they hung out with Jesus and they did life with them. Think about this. That's the way it started. But now we got Acts and Jesus has gone, gone and been transfigured into heaven. And here it is. Every believer was fully devoted to the following to following the teachings of the apostle. Yes, still a teaching ingredient. Is it all about teaching? No. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another. Sounds like love. Hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone. And the apostles performed many signs and wonders. Are we wondering why we're missing some signs and wonders? Okay, our hearts were mutually linked. We were getting together. We are sharing communion. Sounds like a formula to me. This plus, if you want to be a chemist like Dan, you go this plus this plus this has this reaction. And this that will perform this way. Okay, so you get teaching, you link hearts, and you come together for prayer and then a deep sense of holy awe swept over them, miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they, started, they were together as one. Like John chapter 17, Jesus is talking to the other parts of God, and he said, let us be one. Let them be one as we are one. You are one whole body. Body, soul, and spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's always talking about one as coming together as a complete whole, not being disunified with one another, but being together. Fellowship is one body. Do you think they all thought alike, walked alike, talked alike? I don't think so. In fact, you'll see later that they didn't even all speak the same language around there. What if somebody is speaking a different language than you? What do you do? I can't be with them. Fellowship is one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they sold even their assets to distribute to proceeds to those who are in need among them. Daily, listen, daily they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They shared together. They were together, key word being together. They were continually phrased, filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who are coming to life. What brings you to life looks like relationship. Amen. Does it look like a pastor standing and giving a video sermon while you're sitting on the couch in your underwear and your, your bunny rabbit stuff? I don't know if that's going to work over the long game, my friends. That was something that we put so that there was some place to come together during the time when we had a battle and we were separated. But that is not God's design nor his plan. His plan is to unify, to be together, to be a family. One of the biggest attacks out there is on the family. I wonder why. Number two, leaders have mistakenly, and please understand me, the majority of leaders are out there with all their heart, giving all that they have, with a pure heart, doing the best they can with the circumstances that they're given. I mean, my goodness, the positions, I wish, I wish people would humble themselves and put themselves in a place of empathy. And empathy is a place where you get into the other person's shoes, you get into their their circumstances and, and actually feel and go through what they're feeling. And honest to goodness, the leaders of the body in Christ in the United States in the last couple of years have been so difficult. You've got somebody saying, you must wear a mask or I won't come to church. You got other people saying, if you wear masks, I won't come to church. It's an impossible position. And I am so glad that God is moving us out of that 
system and that situation and those things. And, and I just praise God that now some of these pressures are down and it's time to realign the body of Christ. Matthew 28. Think about this. We have redefined discipleship. So I'm going to take you to Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came close to them and said, All authority of the universe has been given to me, Jesus. Now whenever you go, make disciples of all nations. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you and never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. And listen again, he says, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Okay, so leaders by accident because of need have done this thing where it's like, I'm going to launch an online class on Teachable or Kajabi, and we're going to have 100, 200, 1,000 people. I've seen coaches out there, and I'm not coming against coach, and I am one. But they have thousands of people online, and you know what? You become a face in the crowd watching this online class and expecting that to transform your life. Just Pay this price of a million dollars. Join my group. I'm being excessive now. But join this group. Become a face lost in the crowd. And you will get the results of name it that you've always been looking for. Here's the problem. I'm a face lost in the crowd. Ah, those who are out there, please understand we got to have the mentoring factor Yes, Jesus spoke to thousands. He was in front of many. But I'll tell you what, he had his little crowd of gangsters that like, hung out with him and, and did life with him and that knew him when he smelled bad, didn't have a shower, like knew the stuff. It was intimate and it was close. And I'm telling you, you can't get this level of relationship and discipleship being lost in a crowd on a thinkerific or Kajabi class. There has to be an ingredient. If you are, if you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, there, there must be an aspect of intimate relationship or you are just teaching another lesson and everybody, science will show you that the lowest level of learning is just being told what to do. Why aren't I transferred? Why didn't that program work for me? Why am I not going further? Well, I'm telling you, if you're... Many of us, unwilling to invest in ourselves, to, to even promote and bless. Think about this. Jesus was the greatest mentor ever to walk the earth. And you know what people did? They blessed him with finance. They kept him going. They supported his ministry. He was able to take care of his family. They didn't just say, oh, do, give me it all for free while I sit here and take, right? So... There's a lot of us out there that are like, I will not invest in myself to work with a mentor that will specifically and intimately train me to grow up and be mature in God. You know what we do? We go, well, a book's only $9.99, so I'm just going to read this book, and I'll be just fine, and then I'm going to read another book, and I'm going to read another book, and I'm going to read another book, and all these books later, you're like, God, I have tried everything and I have not seen total reformation of my life. I haven't been totally transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I'm, why is that? Because he designed it to do, to be done in the context of relationship. There's leaders. There's other parts of the body. There's other brothers and sisters and friends. We are not called to do this alone. And if you think just reading a book is going to totally transform your life, you are mistaken. Outside of the context of relationship, we are missing something. And it has got me so irritated because it's a word for us to realign. No, you don't idolize a leader and totally um, impoverish yourself to to follow some sort of like idolized 
arrogant, narcissistic leader. No, you're not. But you also value the humble leader servant that is there to serve. Leaders are there to serve, not command, first of all. But if we discard, we can't, we can't put a machine in the midst of this. This is a relationship-based life. If you want to be totally transformed by the renewing of your mind, there is an ingredient of relationship, one being Holy Spirit and one being other people. And you know what? I hate to tell you, and this really sucks, but the things that are going to grow you the most are the people that vehemently disagree with you because the pressure produces progress. The pain produces, produces strength. It's like working out. I'm going to do my workout, my relational workouts. If everything's easy and everybody always agrees to me, then <laughs> say it's easy. Why would I need to grow? But it's through the hard times, through the painful times, that God raises up, us up to be mighty warriors, full of character, full of vigor, full of peace in the midst of any circumstance. If you can look at the people you vehemently disagree with, with a lens of love, I am telling you, you will grow in the midst of relationships. You can't do away with mentors. You can't do away with enemies. Every story has a hero, every story has a guide, and every story has a villain. And you got to have all the ingredients to really see the amazing, glory-filled, epic ending. Lastly, so let me wrap these up. Okay, let me wrap these up. First, we redefined the church as I'm going to sit and look at a screen and redefine discipleship as I'm going to take a class or read a book. But what God is saying is that ministry and growth and transformed lives happen in the context of relationship with him and with each other and sometimes even in the midst of our enemies. So this is what he's calling us to do now. We are to face these things together. Don't you remember, like, this is the church, this is the people, this people. Open the doors and see all the people. There we go. Church people, church people. It's about people. Can't stop saying people. Okay. When things are going wrong and you don't feel put all together, and maybe uh, there's this meme that's going across Facebook sometimes with this carried dog that's all, like, wonkied up, and then the other one's all, like, prim and proper for church. Hey, tell you that's not real life. If you're going to be somebody that's like, if my makeup's not just right, maybe I'm carrying a little extra squishy, a little cuddliness, if something's not just right, and I'm going to be prim and perfect, I'm going to put on my church face. The thing is, you're going to be tempted to isolate, hide yourself, or not fully show up. You know, when I was asked a question, I think last two weeks, the question was raised, like, what do we need? What, what do I specifically need? And actually, the word the Lord was showing me is, I need you to fully show up. If you want to support your leader, if you want to support your family, if you want to see your local church grow, show up. Be present. Like, be ready to go. Want to learn. Like, get ready to... Put stuff in and pour stuff out. Show up. Be present. Be fully present. Cast distractions aside. Tired of the excuses. Like seriously, some of the things I've had to focus in the midst of, come on, we can do better. Don't get distracted. Stay zeroed into the line. We are here to worship Jesus together as a family, period. And nothing else should come in the way of that. No food, no beverage, no whatever come in the way of the fact that we are here to come together in a family relational time to do life together, to be close, to be completely authentic and transparently the people that God created us to be. Then you will see that the church begins to come alive again. The church begins to grow again. When we can truly come and show up and be who we truly 
fully are because you know what? Shame has got to go. Shame has got to go. Listen, when things go wrong or you don't feel all put together and you're tempted to isolate, the word that stands out to me is the word tempted. It means we're tempted to believe a lie and to come into shame. Listen to this definition of shame. Shame is the painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable, improper, ridiculous, something done by oneself or another. (laughs) I hate to tell you this, guys. You want to know the answer to shame? Bring it out in the light. So maybe my hair's all nappy one day. I come anyways. Why? Because I'm just going to be authentically who I am. Because when I come authentically as who I am, I get the opportunity to grow. I get the opportunity to fail. I get the opportunity to succeed. When you fail, you have an opportunity to learn. When you succeed, you have an opportunity to celebrate. Let's not get rid of our opportunities by walking in shame. Listen, I was at Bethel Redding one time, and so many of the ladies talked about a season, and these are like big names, like we know them. Jen Johnson was one of them, like Kelosh, everybody sees her, she's on stage, and God calls these ladies into a time where they literally stop wearing makeup completely, and that has got to suck. I'm sorry, really? But they still had to show up. They still had to get on stage. They still had to be seen. To me, that made such a statement counter to shame. It was unbelievable. Authenticity is a kryptonite to shame. Authenticity is a kryptonite to shame. How? We're self-aware and acknowledging what we're feeling and experiencing. Listen, here we go. Observe yourself. Can you actually step back and non-judgmentally observe yourself for a moment? Why am I experiencing shame right now? Shame comes from these things. An unmet expectation of love. Feeling excluded. Feeling exposed unwantedly. And disappointment. So if I'm going to step back and I'm going to observe what I'm feeling, what I'm going through, and I'm like, I can't show up today. What am I going through? Do I have an unmet expectation of love? Am I feeling excluded? Am I feeling exposed? Am I disappointed? What is it? And then you know what you do? You counter that with exposing it, not hiding it, and actually being genuine in the midst of it. Listen, not everyone will get it. Not everyone will know how to respond. Pastor Jan, can you come up? <clears throat> Not everyone will get it. Not everyone will know how to respond. But the fact is, you will have the opportunity to either celebrate a success or learn from a failure. I think the church today has to remember that relationship is everything, whether it would be with God or with others, and that we will always build up and never tear down. And here's the thing. We... We as Ignite now, specifically at night, we are called to step fully into our identity in Christ, to do life on purpose so that we get to fulfill that God-given destiny that he has for us. It's identity, purpose, and destiny. It's it's our lifeblood, both in the church here and in my coaching business. We have to be solid in our identity so that we can do life on purpose, intentionally, so that we can fulfill our God-given destiny. Can we do that today? The only way we can do that is to be authentic, transparent, letting love and kindness be the motivation in all we do, period. God is refining and realigning the church as a whole, but some, some of us have mistakenly within the process n- navigating COVID and navigating things. Just we redefine in a way that is not quite in alignment with the kingdom. Yes, those big sermons have their place to listen to them in the shower, to learn and to grow, but they cannot be in place with, with coming together as a body learning to stand in our identity, supporting one another, cheering each other on, doing things intentionally so that we can fulfill our God-given purpose. And here is a word. 
God says in this season and always, we are to face things together. Right now, the enemy is shame, and the remedy is authenticity and selflessness. So right now, I just release over us just an impartation of letting love and kindness be the motivation in all we do, no matter, no matter what is happening, no matter what circumstance, we respond in love. And here's the thing. Here's where we're headed. Our sermon series, this is where we're going, is faith, hope, and love. The great of these, of these being love. Here's the thing. We got to define love so we know if we are in the bounds or out of the bounds of love. So that's where we're headed. So it's coming together. Relationship is everything. Standing straight up in our identity, being intentional so that we can fulfill our God-given destiny. Can we do that? Can we set our eyes and our hearts on that? Here's my question. What are you going to do with this work today? Are you going to keep sitting on your couch in your jammies with your bunny slippers on? Or are you going to get up and out? And are you going to begin to have relationship with people with intentionality? Are you going to begin to have that relationship with God with intentionality? Do you, do you want to continue to f- fulfill a mediocre life? Do you want to continue to just be fighting fire after fire after fire? Or do you actually want to step into what God has for you? To be able to do it, you're going to have to be transparent, authentic, and you're going to have to be about relationship and love. God is redefining the, the role of the church for us back into alignment for what he originally purposed and design is designed to do together in love. Let me just pray for you guys. And then I really want you to consider this over the week and also remember your mom. You may hate her. Some, some people hate their moms. But she did the stuff. She birthed you. And she raised you and she loved you and she laid her life down for you. Maybe not every mom, but most moms. So can love and kindness be the motivation in your heart and do something? See, that's the thing. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It just has to be something. Most moms are just happy to hear, hey, I love you. Let me give you a hug. Most of them. I encourage you to be there for your mamas today. All right. Daddy God, we just thank you for all you're doing. Holy Spirit, thank you for this amazing word and this invitation into depth of relationship to revive relationship. God, we just ask you to teach us to love. Teach us to love in this season, to truly love in any circumstance. Lord, show us what love is. God, give us revelation that we've never had before. Give us an irritation with the inauthentic. Let us not accept it anymore. (sighs) Let's throw it away to come straight up in alignment with your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I just bless these guys as they go on their way today. Let goodness and mercy follow them all the days of their life. Lord, that they they get into a depth of gratitude that they've never seen. Lord, would you woo their hearts and pursue them as you always have. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Bless you guys. Happy Mother's Day.